I think the, the key risk for any investor coming into this is coming to terms with where the energy transition is going. Ultimately, the energy transition is going to drive demand. Um, yes. And you go back and you go, well, where is this likely to happen? And, and the analogy I use is the Apple iPhone. The Apple iPhone is, is you know, 15 years old. The Tesla is 15 years old. However, the mobile phone, if you were an early adopter and you bought a, uh, a Motorola back in, in the 80s, it weighed a kilo and a half and had a fantastic battery life for 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, we've come a long way. So when people look at the energy transition, they say, oh, we're not selling as many EVs as we did or whatever. I go back and say, you need to look at the bigger picture and not listen to the noise. Graphite is one of the most important metals when it comes to building like batteries and electric vehicles. In fact, even more graphite is needed than lithium if you want to build an EV. So today with me is John de Vries and he is CEO of a company called BlackRock Mining. And BlackRock is actually developing the manganese graphite project in Tanzania. That's a massive project with the second largest reserve globally. John, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, having the conversation about Mahingi. As you said, it's a very large and very exciting project in Tanzania, and we think it's got a, a very significant role to play in the energy transition uh, as we go forward. Great, that sounds good. But before we dive deeper into your project and all the details, let's start pretty basic, right? Why don't you just give us some insights of the graphite industry? I mean, how is the industry structured? I know that China dominates the market, a large part of the market at least. The US and probably Europe also in the future want to distance themselves from, from China. So give us a little bit of insights. How's the market structured? Yeah. We need to have a little bit of historical context on that, in that the dominance of China in the graphite space is, is, is an outcome of graphite's initial industrial use, the big volume use, was refractories for steel mills. So if you look in a blast furnace, you'll find inevitably it's lined with, with graphite. Um, and China, as we know, is a very significant player in the global steel market. So what occurred as China developed its steel industry, the steel industries had their own small graphite projects. Uh, these amalgamated over time into larger graphite projects, but are essentially captive for steel mill refractories. As the lithium-ion battery technology and, and volumes began to roll up, these uh, graphite mines started looking at other alternatives and they realised, heck, there's a significant market here And from that, they naturally developed into um, being more than just a, a refractory supplier to a captive steel mill. But it does have a really important feature that is significant to the competitive environment of, of, of the lithium ion supply chain. And that is when we make this intermediate product called spherical purified graphite, we lose about a 50, 60% of the volume comes off as a waste material. It's a dust product. That dust is pelletized and used as recarburizing feed in these blast furnaces. So China's in a unique position of historical legacy of being able to monetize a waste stream. And the other key feature here is there's significant chemical industries associated with the steel business, uh, and they tend to flow off, throw off hydrofluoric acid. Um, which is the other key ingredient in purification of, of SPG. So China has a, a unique position here in that they're able to monetize waste, they're able to secure key processing ingredients at uh, you know, a very, very competitive uh, position. And that really starts to drive uh, why China is so dominant at the SPG stage. Um, the other key feature of the graphite market is uh, we really break this up into what we call small flake and large flake. A large flake, by definition, is fairly rare, uh, which means it commands a significantly higher price. A lot of projects um, would typically get 5 to 10% of their material would be large flake. Mahingi is unusual in that 70% of the material is large flake. And that puts us in a unique position where... Uh, we do produce 
uh, a fine product that goes into lithium mine batteries, but most of our revenue is generated from large flake, which goes into a more diverse industrial um, footprint. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, in that regard, Mahingi is unusual in that we're not competing directly in the lithium mine supply chain, um, but it is critical to being able to take the project forward to be able to sell the product. All right. Great. Thank you very much for your overview of the market and a little bit more of the insights about your supply chain. So let's uh, talk about uh, more about graphite, right? I do have a little bit of graphite here, but what makes graphite different from other commodities like, for example, copper, it doesn't really have a real, let's say, spot price, right? So how are graphite prices made up? I mean, uh, if I have a look at your presentations, you're talking more about a basket price. Um, Many of the investors really understand how to earn money with mining, but how to earn money with graphite mining? Give us a little bit more explanation here. Okay, so firstly, graphite, as I, I said earlier, you have a range of different flake sizes in your project. Um, and these flake sizes are sold into different markets. There's typically five different flake sizes, we call minus 100 mesh which is 100 holes per square inch. The material that goes through that, minus 100. That's the fine material. That goes into the lithium ion supply chain. It's also um, the cheaper form of refractory feed. You end up progressively with larger flake sizes. So first thing you do is you understand what your material looks like and what its flake size distribution looks like. Word of caution here, um, there is an extreme difference between what you'll get in a metallurgical laboratory and what you'll achieve in an industrial scale pilot plant. Um, we have milled over 600 tonnes of ore, so we have a pretty good idea what the material looks like, but we do know there are significant differences between what you get from drill core and what you will get in a pilot plant. In terms of pricing, because we are dealing with different markets, you need to go to a number of different indices. So if you look at our slide deck in detail, you'll see we reference three Chinese entities. Again, like it or not, China dominates the market. So that's where you go for price determination. And what we have to do, because we are covering the whole market, we need three different indices that cover different portions of the market. We pull those together to give us an idea of what our basket looks like. And basket is exactly what it is. It's, it's the weighted average, for want of a better word, of the product we produce. So it's fines, semi-large and very large. It's the average that we would expect to achieve for our product. Uh, and that's how we come up with pricing. Now, we, we're different. We put that out there for, because we think it is important that investors do get to understand the price. They do get to understand the mechanics of how we arrive at a price. Um, and we think because we are using observed market pricing it's, it's probably the most transparent mechanics we can put out there that sounds really good thank you for your background information there uh, but john we already talked about graphite which is uh, good knowledge but i'm also always telling the people and investors that the ceo and the management team is the most important thing right you can have a good project you can have a good ground good drill results but in the end the ceo and the management team they are deciding where my money as investors uh, really goes right you are negotiating you're making the deals so give us a little bit more about your background what makes you the perfect ceo for the company and also an uh, always important question who do you have on your share registry are there any big names and do you and the management team have skin in the game as we say give us a little bit more about uh, the management team background information oh, uh, skin in the game i don't have much skin in the game my wife has all my shares um <laughs> so so my wife has a lot of skin in the game i think by definition that means i have skin in the game as well um so yeah i'm still in the top shareholders of the company um, and, you know, not only we contributed what we call sweat equity, but we've actually committed our hard cash to the company as well. Um, I joined the company in 2017. Uh, my background is that I'm a mining engineer. Um, I've worked globally uh, on project and business development. Uh, I came in to, to help the, the project point in the right direction. And I guess eight years later, somehow I'm in charge trying to build the mine. But having built a few mines in some, some unusual places, um, Tanzania is not a bad place to build the mine. It's, it's a, 
uh, safe destination. Um, we don't have many of the headaches you would normally get in Africa. Um, so, you know, we, we find it's, it's, it's not a bad place to be building a mine. There's certainly uh, more challenging destinations. My management team, um, similarly, uh, similar to me, um, quite a lot of experience. Uh, my head of engineering built Sira's Balama project in Mozambique. So not only does he know how to build a graphite mine, but he's built one before and he built it in Africa. So ticks a few boxes. My chief financial officer uh, and I go back to the early 1990s in Western Australia's gold industry. So uh, we know each other for a long time and, and Paul has done multi-billion dollar projects. And our head of community uh, and people, um, Ray, has a significant background in ESG governance. Uh, and that's absolutely critical given where we are after the project. We, we think we uh, very, very important. We leave a positive legacy. Um, and that legacy, you know, when you look over your shoulder and say, well, what are you proud of? You know, I'd like to think everybody involved in the projects proud of creating a world-class mine that is leading in terms of environmental standards and leading in terms of its adherence to safety. All right, that sounds uh, really good. Um, let's also talk about your strategy going forward, right? You already mentioned that you are here to build a mine. Uh, if we have a look at your presentation, you're telling us that you want to build a mine in, let's say, multiple stages. Like, uh, what's the plan? What's it all about? Does it come down to the cost structure that you don't have to raise that much money, dilute the shareholder that, uh, that bad? Is it more like a cost-efficient way to build a mine? There's really a couple of elements to how we've put together the storyboard and strategy for the company. The first thing is um, when you bring on a new new asset, um, you really got to man manage your capital footprint. So what we've done here is build four small mines. Um, so it's, it's a single mine, single pit, but what we're doing is building a, a separate milling train. Uh, it's a million ton a year, does 90,000 tonnes of graphite. Um, and we take the cash flow from that and we reinvest that in module two, three and four. For want of a better word, if you're building an airline, you could buy an Airbus A380 or you could buy four 320s. Um, we know which one works a lot better in terms of risk. And that's really how we've managed the, the development profile. The other key feature that we've done here is we're not trying to be everything to everyone. So again, if you look at the Uh, the energy transition, you'll see a lot of graphite companies are saying, you know, not only can I mine graphite, but I can make intermediate product and I can make final load. In, in our view, that is equivalent to asking an iron ore junior to build a steel mill. It's a very different business, involves a lot of complexity, and critically, it distracts capital and management from the key part of the game, which is getting the mine up and going. So the second key plank in our strategy is a relationship with POSCO of Korea. Uh, POSCO are taking all of our fine material and will convert that to anode and put that into the lithium ion battery supply chain. So that lets us as a team stay where we are at the top end of the food chain with a lot of focus and a lot of tension and, and leverage our skills. And at the same time, it lets us be part of the bigger picture, uh, POSCO, which has a significant, you know, massive balance sheet, massive market reach and critically has in place the competitive elements that it needs to do to compete against China. POSCO has a steel mill, and that steel mill is adjacent to advanced chemical uh, plants. So it's able to replicate the advantages that China uses to secure the bottom of the cost curve. So, you know, it's pretty important. Don't do everything at once, you know, four modules, crawl, walk, run, uh, and then be part of a supply chain as opposed to being everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. All right. That seems like you really have the risk in mind. Uh, that would have been my next question also. I mean, obviously, if you invest your money into a mining stock, everybody wants to earn money, right? We want the uh, mine to be built. We want to make money with the project. You want it as well. You said you're at the top shareholder. So obviously, you, you are well interested in, in making money with the project. But let's talk about the downside potential real quick. What could be a potential risk for an investor today? I think the, the key risk for any investor coming into this is coming to terms with where the energy transition is going. Ultimately, the energy transition is going to drive demand. Um, yes. And you go back and you go, well, where is this likely to happen? And, and the analogy I use is the Apple iPhone. 
the Apple iPhone is is you know 15 years old. The Tesla is 15 years old. However, the mobile phone, if you were an early adopter and you bought a uh, a Motorola back in in the 80s, it weighed a kilo and a half and had a fantastic battery life for 30 minutes. Yeah, um, we've come a long way. So when people look at the energy transition, they say, oh, we're not selling as many EVs as we did or whatever. I go back and say, you need to look at the bigger picture and not listen to the noise. Um, And, you know, over time, we're going to see a significant penetration of EVs. Uh, They're just going to get better. They're going to get faster. Battery life is going to improve. Um, And you're also going to see that supplemented in countries like Australia and indeed in Africa of solar powered battery stationary storage. Um, not so much the mega batteries that we see in these these core batteries, but it's more the household batteries. And you know, you get many millions of households taking a ten or fifteen kilowatt hour battery. You end up with a lot of graphite in a hurry. Um, and that's we're starting to see that movement in Australia now. Um, mm-hmm. We're starting to see that in a lot of other markets. So I think the big picture um, is is the rate of adoption. I think the other key risk comes back to is geopolitical. Um, we, we, you know, we are trying for supply chain diversity. Um, at the moment, China controls better than 95% of the, the anode space. Uh, and clearly, if you're trying for supply chain diversity, we need to be able to do something about that. But as you pointed out early, you can only do something about that if it's profitable to do so. Um, ultimately, when you deal with government subsidised industries, at some point in time, somebody kicks the crutch out from underneath you. And if you can't stand under your own two feet, you're finished. Um, so, you know, our, our business is set up and it's predicated on a business on a business model that says we need to be competitive at all times. Um, and that's a key difference, I think, where we sit with, with many of our peers. All right. That sounds really great. And I think we touched base on, on all the important things for the beginning, obviously, into getting to know the company. Uh, every investor is, uh, is able to, to download your presentation, which will be linked around the video. Um, maybe for the end, you can summarize for us, why are you as a person, as an investor, as a manager with BlackRock Mining, what makes the company and the project so special for you? Maybe you can just pitch us your three main reasons why you and maybe other investors are with the company. Yeah, look, I'll put my hat on as a mining engineer. Every mining engineer at some point in time has a dream of getting a world-class ore body before somebody got to it before they did. Um, So Mahengi is a world-class ore body, um, is unique. It, it's at the bottom of the cost curve. It's got great logistics. It's got a fantastic product. So from an ore body development perspective, Mahengi keeps popping out every time. Um, it, it's just a great project to be there. I think from a geopolitical risk perspective is you need to work in an environment that you can lock your competitive advantages in. Um, we're running this thing off a grid-powered hydro system. So it's a, you know, Power in Tanzania is 70, 80% hydro power now. So this is low carbon intensity and critically, it's it's a credibly priced product. And we're not expecting significant price rises in our power tariff because it would impact the rest of Tanzania as well. So we're able to lock ourselves in a competitive position at the bottom of the cost curve. The third part is I think I look back and say, you know, um, when somebody says to me in the senior citizens home, what am I proud of? I'm proud of actually building a safe mine, doing it environmentally responsibly and playing a critical role in the energy transition as we move forward and do something meaningful about climate change as opposed to just talking about it. That sounds really great. John, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, obviously, this is no investment advice. Every investor is uh, should make their own due diligence, but uh, you uh, gave us a great explanation, great overview about your company, about your background, about the story and uh, the plans going forward. John, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you, Jan. It's been good talking to you and uh, I hope your investors do well. Thank you. Thank you.